Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, get to know the grizzly bears of the Canadian Rockies. Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Leanne Thompson. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Take it away, Leanne. Thanks, Rob, and thanks everyone for joining today. I'm super pumped uh, to talk about bears. I love bears. Uh, it's gonna be a task for me to stay on point and make sure this webinar doesn't last about six hours. So we're gonna do our best <laughs> um, and I'll try to make sure to stay on topic and focus here. But um, we are here to talk about grizzly bears. First of all, I shall introduce myself. Um, so yes, my name is Leanne Thompson. I am an expedition leader working with Natural Habitat Adventures. I started with NatHab in 2018, began with our polar bears. So you can see my affinity for polar bears is already, uh, or for bears in general is right there. Um, but also do the other programs in Churchill, Northern Lights, Belugas. I've worked in our Cotswolds programs, of course, the Canadian Rockies, Iceland as well. Um, I have a degree in zoology and a master's in conservation education, which basically just gives me an excuse to be a super nerd and uh, talk to people about the things that I love, um, which just happens to be nature um, and lots of fun things associated with that. So I do live in British Columbia. Um, I'm just a couple of hours from kind of where we're focusing. I live right, right along the uh, Rocky Mountain National Parks here, which is what I'll show you next. Um, this is gonna be kind of our area that we're focusing on. So I would live underneath where it says Kootenai National Park. I would go a little bit further south down that Highway 93. Um, but where we're gonna focus for today is in our national parks. So you'll hear me say Banff National Park. Most people are quite familiar with that. Um, pretty popular park, uh, but also I'll be talking um, parts about Yoho National Park as well as Kootenai National Park. And those three, along with Jasper, right, make up our Canadian Rocky Mountain National Parks. Yoho and Kootenai tend to be a little bit lesser known. They are on the British Columbia side of their provincial border, whereas Jasper and Banff are in Alberta. But I'll be talking about these national parks, so just keep them in mind. Um, we are going to focus on our grizzly bears, but I do just, of course, have to point out that we do have two bear species that do live within our Canadian Rocky Mountain National Parks. Um, so we do have our black bear, Ursus americanus. Uh, most people are quite familiar. They are fairly widespread across various areas of North America. So people are usually pretty familiar with these bears. Sometimes people have them wandering around in their backyards or easy to access in kind of some of their backcountry areas. But we do have our black bears that are here in our Rocky Mountain National Park. Parks. But today we are going to focus on the grizzly bear, uh, also known as brown bear. Um, I've worked in regions where they are called a grizzly bear and they've called the brown bear. It is the same species, uh, Ursus arctos, same species across the board. So our grizzly bears that are in the Canadian Rockies are the same species as the brown bears, as you would call them in, the, in Alaska, same species as bears in Russia and in Spain, um, in lots of areas. So. All of them are Ursus arctos. Ursus is actually Latin for bear. Arctos is Greek for bear. So their name is literally bear bear. You don't really get too much more bear than that, which I always think is fun to say. Um, when we're in our national parks and looking for bears, because we do, um, we have our Canadian Rockies uh, uh, program with NatHab, and of course we spend time looking for wildlife, including bears. And uh, I drove through the parks the other day and saw six bears um, just coming in. It was all in Kootenai National Park, but just driving through. And so we do have uh, grizzlies and black bears, as I said. And when we're driving around, when we're looking for them, they can be a little bit hard to tell apart. So people will often say like, oh, well, if it's brown, it's a grizzly bear and if it's black it's a black bear but that's not necessarily true uh, both black and grizzly bears can be brown they can be white they can be black and various shades of in between all of those so you can't necessarily go by color grizzly bears are typically larger than black bears but you can have a pretty large looking black bear and you can have smaller grizzly bears so there can always be some overlap there and i find size can be quite arbitrary you can look at an animal and you go wow that is a huge bear and then you see a much bigger bear and then all of a sudden that bear looks quite small 
So size is a bit diff uh, difficult to use too. We can do things like look at their claws. Grizzly bears have much longer claws. Uh, black bears have the shorter claws. And this re the reason for this is that grizzly bears are using their claws mainly for digging. Um, so they're digging lots. And what it makes is a lovely shoulder hump. So that's one of the main ways that people will tell a grizzly bear apart from a black bear. Because grizzlies are spending so much time digging, they end up developing this big muscle between their shoulder blades and they've got that nice shoulder hump. However, sometimes you can see a bear that's kind of standing off center or maybe has one paw lower down and their shoulder blades sometimes can make it look like they have that hump. So you gotta watch the bears for a bit. We can look at their facial profile. Do they have a dished face like that grizzly bear um, or kind of more of a straight face of the black bear? You can look at their ears, um, lots of different cues, but sometimes it's really hard to figure out if you're looking at a black bear or a grizzly bear. I've looked at bears for several minutes before being able to feel confident about what it is that I'm looking at. Sometimes you spend those several minutes looking at their rear end and that's why it's a bit more difficult, but you gotta take your time so you can feel a little bit more confident. We can also look at habitat and habitat is going to come into play for the rest of the uh, webinar that we're going to talk about today. Um, but grizzlies, they do tend to live in more open habitat, whereas a black bear tends to be in more forested habitat. Um, when we talk about our grizzlies here in the Canadian Rockies, so grizzly bears, brown bears, they are in the order carnivora, so they are a carnivore. But we often call these guys omnivorous carnivores. Um, and that's just because the Rocky, they're the bears that we have here, they can be di eating a diet of 75% or more vegetarian. Quite different from many of the bears that people are familiar with in Alaska that subsist a lot on the salmon runs here in the interior. We don't have all those salmon runs. So instead, these bears are adapted to eat a lot more vegetable matter. So here they'll be eating a variety of different plant species, and we'll talk about a couple of them. Um, one of them is very obvious in this in this picture. Um, it's a picture that I took a couple of years ago at this exact time of year, and it's the dandelions. It is the one of the main things that these bears are eating at this time of year. But as they go throughout the summer, what type of plants they're eating does change, what's available year to year. We can have differences, but they essentially are eating a massive amount of uh, plants. They will have other foods that they'll eat, of course, for protein, they'll eat bugs, um, they'll eat on, feast on carcasses if they can make kills, they'll make kills. But as I said, our, our bears here are quite unique in that they are largely vegetarian. But everything that they're doing is with the goal of putting on weight. They have to put on weight. They have to eat a lot of food. So you can imagine how much plant matter these guys are eating in order to make sure that they have enough weight on them. And what is it that they need to have enough weight on them for? Um, one, probably comes pretty simply to your brains, is hibernation. These bears do hibernate, so they go into a den and they spend their winter sleeping. Um, I'm sure that there are some other people out there who would love to be participating in that, avoid the winter altogether and just sleep through it. But if you're going to participate in that, you have to have a lot of weight on you. So our bears go into this hyperphagic um, state where they're just eating and eating and eating and eating. They want to get as fat as they possibly can. So when they go in and hibernate, as they lose weight, they're not super skinny. You want to be nice and fat going into hibernation. The other one, which is one of my favorite topics, and I could probably do an entire webinar on just bear reproduction, so this is where I have to stay focused, um, but the other reason why it is important for them to have a weight on is for reproduction. So right now, May and June, it is breeding season for our bears in the national parks here. So they will breed, uh, sperm meets egg, but no development is actually happening throughout the summertime. Um, it states the blastocyst, the set of cells, sits in a state of dormancy. And it is not until the fall in which uh, the embryo might start developing. So it's something called delayed implantation. And that, whether or not an embryo starts to develop and a cub is produced, is dependent on the female's weight. So the females, this is the part that's just incredible, is that bears' bodies, they'll, they'll essentially do an analysis. Does a, bear, does a female bear have enough weight on her to survive hibernation, but also survive hibernation, producing a fetus and nursing a fetus? You need to make sure that you have enough weight on to do all of those things. And if their bodies do not have enough weight on, it would be completely pointless to waste energy producing a cub that's not likely to survive and could threaten the survival of a female. So instead, if a female does not weigh enough, then the um, cells just simply reabsorb and no cub is produced and she'll try again in the following spring. However, 
if she does have enough weight on her, um, and this is typically looked at, um, or our understanding is the uh, lipid content of their blood, depending on that, then their body will decide to implant um, and develop a fetus and have a cub. Uh, I just think it's absolutely amazing that their bodies are capable of doing that and essentially making this choice for them. But what that means is that if a female does not have enough weight, she will not have a cub. So it is very, very important for her to have enough weight on her. And when we look at um, home ranges for our bears, home ranges are greatly affected by the amount of food that is available. So again, um, for example, um, this photo I took was in Brooks Falls. And Brooks Falls, you can see in this picture, there are several bears all overlapping. Their home range is much smaller because there is simply more concentrated food. If you go to areas where you don't have as concentrated a food, your bears need to be more spread out because otherwise you have too many bears going after too too small amount of resources. So as we look into British Columbia, you can see that home range has gotten much larger. We can go into the Arctic where resources are even more scarce. Um, and then they have a much, much larger home range. Now home ranges, they are an estimate. Females typically have a smaller home range than our males, which is why we see a scale. But they're estimates, and you'll see shortly that um, some of those estimates can just be completely wrong. If we look at 270 miles in the BC area, uh, miles squared, um, you'll see how wrong that is for a bear coming up later. But if they have such harm, home, large home ranges where they need to cover for that amount of food, they also still need to find each other for reproduction. And if your density is not very high, how are they finding each other? And so some of it has to do with bear communication. Another topic you could probably talk about for hours and hours. But two things that we'll kind of look at here just to mention is stomp trails. So on our left hand side, you can kind of see it looks like someone has just stomped. And that is exactly what these male bears will do. They're stomping and they you know, move their foot around to make sure they're really putting their print in there. They've got scent glands along their um, the pads of their feet and they're leaving their scent there. We can use rub trees as well. Some people are quite familiar with these. You can go wander around in forests sometimes and find them. They've been scratched, they've been bitten, they've been rubbed on. You can see lots of videos of bears doing funny dances, uh, but essentially uh, they're leaving their scent on these trees. Males, they'll be scenting to say that they are a big, dominant, impressive male. You want to breed with me. And females can be scenting around to say that uh, they are available for breeding. So they have to find each other. They have to make sure that breeding can occur because if they're not in the same space, then it simply will not happen. And one male, we'll get into some of our males specifically in the or in our um, in Banff National Park and surrounding area. Um, one male that's very prominent is a bear that has been named the boss. Uh, our bears do also have numbers, of course, and most bears in the parks are known by their numbers, but some of them uh, naturally just end up with a, um, a bit more personality. People know them a little bit more. So this one is the boss. Um, probably from that name, you can gather he is the largest and most dominant male bear that we have in our national parks. Uh, his age is probably about early to mid 20s, which is getting up there in uh, in age, kind of the average age for a bear, a uh, grizzly bear in the wild can be typically 20 to 25. So he's already in that range. Every year that he comes out of his den right now, people are super pumped. There are news articles that come out that say the boss is awake. He's up and he's moving and people literally flock in to try and get photos of him. You'll see his home range, uh, 950 square miles. So that is way, way larger than the average bear in this region. Um, but he just likes to cover a lot of ground. Uh, imagine the amount of food that he has to eat in order to become this massive bear. He's quite large for a bear in our region. Um, I've read estimates anywhere between 500, 600, maybe even up to 700 pounds, um, which is not at the size that we typically have of our bears here. Um, and so he's a very, very large bear. He's got to eat a lot of food, got to cover a lot of ground. Because he's also covering that all that ground, he also does lots of breeding. It's estimated that within Banff National Park, he is likely the father of about 70% of the cubs produced um, since he started reproducing. And then still several more that he has produced um, in Kootenai National Park and Yoho National Park. So he's a pretty big, big and busy, busy guy.
Um, he's known for a few things. Um, so he uh, actually did kill and eat a black bear uh, back in 2013. So bears, they don't often predate upon each other, but it certainly does happen. And when you've got boss, the big, big boy, um, he's got to eat. And so he'll figure that out. So he has was known for predating uh, upon this black bear and eating that sometimes hikers go and stumble upon a bear feasting on a carcass. One thing that he's also very well known for is that uh, I've been told he has been twice hit by a train. Now, of course, this isn't going to mean that he's getting catapulted by our train, but he has been hit by a train twice and still does not seem to be afraid of the railways. We'll come back to railways a little bit later on in the presentation, but again, a very impressive bear if he's been able to encounter a train more than once um, and live to tell about it. But one thing he's also very well known for is the showdowns that he has with another bear that is here. And that bear is named Split Lip. So it is another very uh, dominant and impressive male. Um, he would be bear number 136. He, uh, yeah, very dominant, very large as well. Most people will say that he is a bit smaller than uh, the boss, but the two of them do duke it out sometimes um, and their weights are both very, very impressive. Um, both of these bears, both the boss and Split Lip are known for not being overly aggressive to females or to sorry to females to people um, because they're such popular bears they do end up spending a lot of time near people everyone wants to take photos and they don't seem to be that bothered by people we'll see how that changes and come back to it again later on um, with boss later on in this presentation but in general they're pretty passive they're not um, super confrontational um, He's also known for eating other bears. So um, this one was in 2015. And in 2015, it was a particularly bad crop year. And so I talked about how our bears here, they are largely eating vegetation. And of course, climate change is having an impact on the vegetation that's available. Is it an earlier start? Is it a later start? Are we having freeze thaws that, that, that are affecting it? What is the precipitation like? A whole lot of stuff is affecting their food uh, security. And so sometimes in years where there is uh, lower crop yields, then it's when we see more of this cannibalism, um, which is what happened in 2015 with split lip. Uh, again, it was another thing where hikers just stumbled upon it and then they end up closing down areas while he feasts. Um, split lip is also known for killing bear cubs. He has done that on more than one occasion. And this can happen because uh, we talked about breeding already a cub will be produced and for our grizzly bears they do typically stay with their mom for about two to three years and so it's a two to three year breeding cycle and males their focus in life is i must pass on my genetics and if they're walking around and they spot a bear uh, a female that has cubs that are not theirs then what's what's the plan oh i'll wait a couple more years until that female is available no, um, they do kill cubs and so that they can make that female more or uh, make that female available for breeding again. Obviously, those females will fiercely defend their cubs, uh, but um, it does happen. Infanticide where an adult is killing um, young does occur and split lip is kind of known for doing that. So I do have a video here. Uh, I think it's about two minutes, but it is essentially showing the showdown between the boss and split lip. Um, I always try to have fun with videos here. But here we go. All of a sudden she goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's another bear, there's another bear coming. I glance over and without a doubt, it is the boss. He comes marching across the road and as soon as he sees split lip, he just bolts right at him like a freight train. And they are the two heavyweights right now. <laughs> The boss and Split Lip have both been around in Banff National Park now for at least 15 years, and they're both in the five to 600 pound range, depending on the time of year. So they're both big, big grizzly bears, dominant male grizzly bears. They've really become the two most iconic, most famous bears around. Split Lip in part because he has, uh, as recently as this year, killed uh, cubs of 142. He actually killed one of the cubs of 142 right on the Bow Valley Parkway. And then the boss has been the boss. He's been the most dominant bear really for about uh, almost a decade now. These two definitely have a big overlapping territory, and, and grizzly bears are very, very territorial, uh, particularly the males. Well, it ran right at us initially, 
um, to, to get out of the way of this freight train barreling down on them. And the boss just missed them with a big swipe. And then they went racing through this little meadow, spinning around and spiraling through it and onto the Bow Valley Parkway with the boss right on Split Lip's heels. Get out to the Bow Valley Parkway in time to see the boss chasing Split Lip for three kilometers down the middle of the Bow Valley Parkway, <laughs> in and out of the ditch, and weaving back and forth on the road. And, you know, these two big, fat bucks <clears throat> just roaring down the road. It was and really quite a sight to see. The boss is definitely still the boss. Yeah, so that video does a great job of kind of showing that dynamic and that relationship. Um, it is very exciting for people to see those two uh, out and around in the national parks. The Bow Valley Parkway, uh, it is a road that um, kind of runs parallel to the, um, the highway, the main highway that goes through the national parks. And it's well known as being a great wildlife corridor. People go down there, including on our trips. We go drive down there specifically in search of wildlife. Um, obviously, you don't always see wildlife on them, but it's a common area where bears like the boss and split lip are seen. Um, so they do have a very interesting dynamic. They'll do get out, they'll fight. Um, oh, I should probably say split lip um, is obviously named split lip. You can imagine that he has a split lip. Uh, we're very creative here, you know. So um, the boss and split lip, they do have that very interesting dynamic. And because they're so popular, uh, one of the things we'll start talking soon about uh, all the stuff that Parks Canada is doing to protect the bears here. But one of those things is to implement no stopping zones. And so we have these highways, we have areas where we know people are actively scanning and looking for wildlife. But if we're stopping all of the time on the highways, not only is this bad and dangerous for the bears, but it's also dangerous for people. If you've driven around in our national parks sure we have some straight areas but we also have a lot of this with our roads and if you end up with a whole whack load of people who are stopped along the side of a road in very windy uh, areas it can become very dangerous um, so we end up with these wildlife traffic jams and so every year so this article is brand new this one's from 20, 2024 the video is um, the video footage is several years old at this point um, but Every year we're looking at when we're implementing these no stopping zones, reducing speed limits as well. So that's the Boston split lip, but there's another bear that has become quite famous and has also contributed to um, making more of these no stopping zones. So um, again, this is not just occurring in Banff National Park. Nakoda, um, who is this white grizzly bear, uh, she is typically hanging out in the Yoho National Park area, does, does of course come hang out in Banff as well, but both of these parks, or all of these parks in the areas are going to have no stopping zones and many other um, kind of factors in place to try and protect them. So Nakoda, um, Bear 178, she is a white grizzly. So you can imagine that she is very popular. She is um, really loved, again, why she's got this name. She's only seven and a half years old now, um, and she already does have a name because she is so well known. So she's well known for a few different reasons, but of course her white coloring is one of them. She's not an albino bear. Um, it is a recessive gene, and she was uh, born with another sibling. Uh, her sibling was brown, um, but back in 2022, her sibling did get hit by a car um, and killed. So um, obviously there's a lot of protection of wanting to make sure that Nakoda, along with other bears, but of course everyone has a love and an affinity for Nakoda um, to be uh, preserved. And at this point, <clears throat> she is the only young female that is actively breeding in this area. So again, super, super important to be protecting. Now, Nakoda, um, she is known for a few things. One is her acrobatics. Uh, I spoke earlier about our differences between our black bears and our grizzly bears. Black bears are climbers, grizzly bears not so much. Not to say that I would put all my faith in a grizzly bear not climbing. Of course, they can climb, uh, but they just don't tend to do it as much. But Nakoda does not like to go by those rules. Uh, she is a climber. She loves to climb anything and everything. And she's climbing commonly over our fences, getting onto our highways and finding all of the areas. This is what she's doing right now um, to where all of these dandelions are. 
So one of the things that they have done is that they relocated her. So this is was again back in 2022 because her and her sibling were known for doing this coming on. It is why her sibling got um, hit and killed in June of 2022. And so later that month, Nakoda was actually captured. This is when they confirmed female. They put a um, GPS collar, a tracking collar on her and they relocated her um, away from the parks. Um, and she has moved back into the parks. Relocation has been uh, a tactic that can be used, but it isn't, I would say, the most consistently used um, or most advantageously used uh, tactic of protecting people in the national parks because some bears, you can go plop them over where you think is very far away. And there are bears that within two days have come right back over to their home ranges. So it's very expensive to get a bear in a helicopter, fly them away, move them to somewhere else. Um, and so that it's just not a tactic that's used a lot. We've also had bears. There was another really famous bear that um, she was causing a lot of problems. And so they decided to relocate her outside of the parks. Um, and as she was making her way back over to the parks, she actually got killed by a hunter. Um, this was prior to the grizzly bear banning hunts that exist now in British Columbia. Um, but there's lots of risk factors that are involved with translocating. Um, so she was relocated away from the park to try and protect her. We're going to talk more about Nakoda a little bit later on. But right now, I want to focus on um, what makes the park so special. So if we look, we've got two maps up here. The one on the right, it's got a label on it. So we're talking about grizzly bear densities. The one on the left, um, people often think, oh, population size, which is essentially true. Um, the one on the left is actually showing light pollution. But where you have more light is where you typically have more people. And if we look at our grizzly bear density, we tend to see that the grizzly bear density uh, is semi the opposite of where the light pollution is. Um, you can look down even at their historic uh, ranges um, right in that area in the middle there where there's just not a whole lot of people. Grizzly bears, they are much more cautious of people. They like to stay away from people. But we have this area where we've got a high concentration of grizzly bears, but also a high concentration of light pollution, meaning that there are a lot of people. Within the national park areas, um, it's estimated between four and four and a half million people every single year are coming to just Banff alone. So there are an absolute ton of people. And if I've just said grizzly bears don't like being around people, why are so many grizzly bears choosing to hang around people and doing so successfully? So now we can see kind of the overlay of that map, um, see those densities. And on the right hand side, you can see the approximate number of grizzly bears in within our national parks. So Banff 65, Jasper 109, Yoho 11 to 15, Kootenai 9 to 16. Um, and some of those numbers may seem relatively low, but for the area that we're talking about, they are high density uh, grizzly bear. Uh, habitat. So what is it that Parks Canada is doing? Parks Canada, kind of our governing body of all of our national parks, what is it that they're doing to make it so that these grizzly bears are able to persist? So one of them is the production of wildlife corridors. So wildlife corridors um, can be created in many different ways, but essentially they are areas that are going to be protected. Um, and sometimes that protection means completely blocking off and allowing only animals to come in here. We do have areas within our national parks where gates come down and nobody is allowed, no vehicles, no bikes, no anything is allowed to go into an area for several months because it's a wildlife corridor. We also have areas, including the Bow Valley Parkway that we just talked about being a, a hot spot for wildlife. Um, at this time of year in the spring, they do have closures on the Bow Valley Parkway um, where vehicles are not allowed to go into certain sections. And all of that is designed to allow wildlife to move freely. So this is really important because I'm sure you've heard about habitat fragmentation. We've got populations over here, populations over here that used to be able to overlap, but because of humans putting some big block, maybe a highway right in the middle, now these populations are completely separate from each other. And we like having overlap because then we get more genetic diversity, we get stronger and healthier animals. So by having wildlife corridors, it can connect some of these different habitats. And these uh, corridors are typically designed um, for our large carnivores. 
in theory, our large corn carnivores tend to have the greatest needs. They need the most amount of food. They need the most amount of space. They have very high demands. So if you are protecting an area that is suitable for our large carnivores, typically all the other animals beneath them, um, quotes, in the trophic cascade should also be uh, protected in that food web. And they also need to consider um, where these carnivores, where these corridors are. Is it habitat that they're actually going to use? If we look at our mountains, we've got our mountain, our valley areas, our subalpine, and then our alpine right up at the top. And say if you're, all your wildlife corridors are happening up in your alpine habitat where you don't have a lot of animals there, it's not really an effective corridor. So we have to be looking at vegetation cover. Um, how easy is it for animals to move in a terrain? Is it a big steep slope? Is it a um, kind of a shallower grade and animals are able to move in those corridors? Everything like that is considered when uh, Parks Canada has designed and implemented many of these wildlife corridors. Um, we can also talk about managing their foraging grounds. Uh, fire, another topic you could go on for hours, I'm sure, but many people are typically quite familiar with the fact that we have done fire suppression and not allowed fires to happen for many, many years. Uh, Canada is pretty well known. People are constantly hearing about the fires that are happening um, in BC, around um, the mountain parks, everything like that, in and around the mountain parks. And it's because for decades we did not allow fires. Fires, bad, fires, scary, put fires out. But what that did was create monoculture forests. Forests, ecosystems, they do have succession plans. This plant likes light. This plant doesn't like light. This plant wants open space. This plant does better not with less space. So all of them have different needs. And if you create only one unified um, kind of set of uh, so, uh, unified parameters, then only certain types of plants are going to be able to survive. We need disturbances, disturbances like fire, disturbances like avalanches, even disturbances like things that we would consider pests like uh, the pine beetles that are coming in and killing some of the trees off. All of those are natural. They are needed. They are required by these ecosystems because when a fire, for example, comes in, it wipes out all of the, the forest and then it allows new growth to start. And one of the things within that new growth is the buffalo berry. A buffalo berry tends to do best growing five to 25 years after um, that section of time after a fire it does like more open area and buffalo berry feeds our bears these berries can start coming out you know july into august um, and our grizzly bears can be eating about 200 000 buffalo berries every single day this is going to be thousands of calories and it is the main food that they're going to be using to put on weight so if we then have no open habitat, no habitat that is suitable for our buffalo berry, we therefore have less food available for our grizzly bears. Less food means a lower population. So by doing things like prescribed burns, as well as allowing fires to happen, then you're allowing um, these optimal foraging grounds to, to thrive um, and help our bear species. So it's another tactic that Parks Canada is doing. They also do something called diversionary feeding. Um, and so what this means, I talked about disturbances. We have an avalanche that comes in over the winter time. This is when our bears are in hibernation. But when that avalanche comes down, sometimes it wipes out things like perhaps a whole herd of elk or a few moose or historically in, in Banff, um, we used to have caribou there and the last herd got wiped out by an avalanche. But those animals get killed in an avalanche. And then you have a bear that awakens from hibernation, wandering around and stumbles across these carcasses. That is a great first meal for a bear coming out of hibernation. Um, and so we can emulate this by having something they call diversionary feeding. And so this is taking carcasses and actually putting them into the back country in areas that would look like avalanche habitat for the grizzly bears, for the bears to find. Um, and this is utilized to try and help keep them in the back country long enough for their food to become properly available where they tend to come down and tend to be closer to people um, in the spring and summer. Each year, we have different uh, weather conditions. Climate change is making things very unpredictable as to what is going to be successful. I talked a little bit about that already, having some really good crop years, some really not good crop years. And so if we've got a spring that is maybe a very late, late spring and food is not available and you have a bunch of hungry bears walking around in, in people places, then that's not going to go very well for that conflict. So keep them out in the back country uh, and it helps to protect our bear species or our bear population, sorry. 
Now, diversionary feeding can be used more in some years than in others, and part of, part of that also has to do with our train. So we have our Trans Canada, um, like our our train line that runs all throughout our country. It cuts the, across the entire country um, from east to west, and um, this train is often carrying grain. Um, it is a big, big problem, and this one is an ongoing problem. Banff, our national parks have not solved all of our bear problems, um, and we'll touch on that and what's going on now. But um, grain is spilled regularly from these trains, and then the bears come in and they're like, great, I'll go hang around at that train track because I've got lots of food that's sitting there for them. Um, and so they are doing things, of course, like trying to make secure, more secure trains. Sometimes when you're here in the national parks, you can hear them um, like sounding their horn, uh, and that is essentially just to tell the bears that the trains are coming and get them away from the train tracks but they can also use this diversionary um, feeding they have done this in years where there's been you know a, a derailment or a massive spill of grain um, it's hard to clean that all up in the winter time so in springtime to allow them enough time to clean up all of the grain they can make sure they can try to put implement tactics to keep the bears uh, in the back country. So the train is still an ongoing issue. Um, it's something that is still actively at play, but they are looking at ways of trying to prevent um, animals getting hit by trains um, because of the grain spills is largely it. Okay, we can also talk about humans, education. Uh, when people were start first back in the national parks, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of like, let's observe that wildlife from a distance. It was, let's see how close we can get. Ooh, that bear's interested. I could feed that bear. There was a lot of habituation, uh, habituation. There was a lot of food conditioning. And this was a very common thing. People would be right next to bears. Thankfully, the tactics in the parks and the, our, our overall education of people has improved. Uh, there's a very common expression, a fed bear is a dead bear, um, and that has to do with food conditioning. If, people, if bears start associating people with food, then they're going to be in trouble. So there is no feeding of, of uh, animals in the parks. This should be something that people employ everywhere they go. We should not be feeding our wildlife, but just the general education has improved a lot. Uh, parks will also do many things like patrolling our campgrounds so we can see the campground that's set up on the left. Um, if you're there, it's okay, but people leaving their campgrounds looking like that to go off for a day hike, people do come in and they will come. At Parks Canada will take all your stuff that is dangerous for bears. You can go and collect it later, but they will take your coolers and your burners. Uh, I was once camping and had just left an empty uh, water dish and they took the water dish. So anything that's kind of left, they will take. You can go collect them after but there's a ton of education uh, put in to make sure that people know how to exist and live even temporarily in our parks. Uh, bear spray, it's very common here. Anytime I go with a hike for a hike, I have bear spray with me. This is of course our last line of defense. We are not wanting to use our bear spray, but it's a good idea to have it because it can prevent um, any actual physical contact from happening. If a bear is coming a bit too close, you can use bear spray and keep that bear um, farther away from you. Bottom right hand side, we have our bear bins, our garbage bins. So these are specifically designed for bears to not be able to open, but people can open them. Um, there's the common joke, people have often heard it, of uh, how we've designed these things. And sometimes it's quite tricky for people to figure them out. But the bears are very, very smart. Um, and so sometimes these bears can just figure out how to sneak in and wiggle things. So as the design of developed, they had to consider the, this is the joke part, the significant overlap between the least intelligent people and the most intelligent bears. Um, so it created some conflict as to how tricky they could make some of these garbage bins. Um, another thing to talk about is wildlife paparazzi. I am a photographer. I love taking pictures of animals. I love seeing bears in the wild. I love taking pictures of bears in the wild. But unfortunately, there is a lot of this, this picture that we have in the bottom left, people getting out of their cars and being very close to their bears. Um, it's why we have no stopping zones. It's why we have fencing. It's why we have Parks Canada patrolling. We also, and this is something that I love as how uh, wildlife photography is evolving. Um, we have some really prominent wildlife photographers in our national parks that are refusing to go and take photos of some of these animals and are 
encouraging others, anyone and everyone, to avoid going and, and finding these animals. Nakoda, our white grizzly bear, being one of them. Um, they're really putting a stand down and saying if our photographers, our really famous photographers, are making a stand and encouraging people to not go take photos of bears when it can be endangering them, um, hopefully it'll encourage uh, less people or more people to, to start having that respect and not promoting everything all over social media. So um, try to reduce that and the education that comes with that. Parks Canada also does re-education, but this time not of people, but of bears. And so um, this is important to happen. We talked, I said how I was going to mention the boss again. Uh, the boss is typically not a bear that likes to be confrontational with people, uh, but he has had to last year, you'll see this one September 2023, was hazed um, last year because he was sitting on uh, people's fruit trees in their yards. So Parks Canada does do this re-education hazing of bears and it is essentially trying to reinstall that um that healthy fear of humans bears should hear fear humans it's important for them we should also have a healthy love respect and fear of our bears as well um, fear is not the word i like using so much on the people side of things but we do want our bears to be fearful of people because then they choose to stay away so what they'll do is they can shoot off cracker shells something that makes a lot of like bang bang really loud noises they'll just run away from that um, bean bags actually hit them uh, with the bean bags ouch that hurt i don't like this i'm going to leave um, they don't want to do any um, like long term or permanent permanent damage, that's not the goal. The goal is essentially to encourage the bears to move in an opposite direction. And one of the things that I found really fascinating is that Parks Canada will use certain expressions. And many people, if you hike and walk around in bear country, um, when you're walking around, yes, we have our bear spray, but we also like to make a lot of noise so talking is great but even saying like hey bear yo bear like talking like that uh, parks canada will actually use that so they'll say hey bear and then they shoot and they'll hit that bear with a bean bag and so then that bear learns oh, when someone says hey bear something bad happens i think i will leave so that way when people are wandering around within the parks and people are yelling hey bear not because they've seen a bear, but just to make a loud noise to make themselves present. If a bear, say, is not too far away from them, we'll hear that and they go, ooh, I don't like that noise. It's conditioning, right? They've conditioned them to then want to move farther away. So it's educating bears to help keep them farther away from people. Um, we do also have complete closures uh, that happen. So this can be hikes uh, or areas, we've already talked about the road, but hikes that get completely closed down because of bear activity. This has happened when both Split Lip and the boss were feasting on a carcass. Um, they will make it so that the, that uh, area is then closed. No hikers are allowed to go in there to, until the bears have moved on. We do also have areas in the parks that at certain times of year is where we know our bears tend to congregate. And so therefore they have a minimum group level uh, or group size sorry and so you have to have at least four people to walk in certain areas making noise and it's just uh, to help with the protection so it helps keep our bears uh, protected um, I think this is the last one that I've got to talk about here, but it is often named as Canada's biggest conservation success story. Uh, if you've driven around here or seen them, you maybe even have ones closer to home where you are, but Banff uh, is really, really well known for these overpasses and underpasses. So what's pictured here over top of that highway is one of our overpasses so it was kind of constructed in 1996 1997 um, underpasses so these ones are much harder to get a picture of but it's going to be a pass underneath the highway and as of right now um, there was 48 structures but more are being constructed i was driving between banff and calgary uh, like a week and a half ago and they're building another one they're building another one of the overpasses and when they were putting the, these in, there was many people, there was biologists, um, locals, people who lived here that just thought it was a complete waste of money. These structures are not cheap um, and they did not think that it was going to work. Animals are not going to use those or predators might sit and wait for then the prey animals. It's funneling the prey animals to them. And so they thought for sure this was not going to work. No one is going to be using those uh, structures. Uh, it's been well over 20 years um, now since 20, yeah, 20, yeah, 20 years. Uh, sorry, trying to do math in my head. It's almost 25 years 
And the first 17 years of these being in place, of the overpasses specifically, uh, they did a whole lot of monitoring on them. So they've got trail cameras up, they're looking to see what is using them. And they actually found in that 17 year time frame, um, it was reducing collisions by almost 80%. And for some species like our, our elk, it reduced in certain areas the collisions by 100%. They have uh, over 11, or no, they had 11 large mammals documented using them. So this would be things like our bears, um, wolves, um, like elk, all of those types of things, bighorn sheep, they're all using them. But we also have an abundance of small animals that are using them too. Um, you know, our foxes, um, a whole bunch of critters, all of these different animals are using these overpasses and underpasses and helping to reduce the collisions. We also have a whole lot of fencing that is um, designed around our, our kind of hot spots, the most dangerous spots for wildlife. So we have fencing that goes all along. You can kind of see if you look closely in this picture and is only open to where those overpasses and underpasses are. And we also have areas in the parks where they're like um, Kootenai. I drive through Kootenai all the time, Kootenai National Park. Uh, we don't have the overpasses there, but we do have lots of fencing um, to help protect the animals in some of the most concentrated uh, or historically concentrated areas where we would have wildlife collisions with vehicles. Funnily enough, I think it's quite comical that uh, insurance companies actually helped to pay for a lot of the fencing that went up because it's helped to reduce the collisions by that much. Um, so in insurance country com companies were really uh, prominent in helping that happen. Um, so then we have to go back into uh, our bears. Uh, this is an update that I actually had to put into the presentation um, on Friday to say that it is not a perfect system. The Parks, Parks Canada and our Rocky Mountain National Parks are really impressive and they have done an immense amount of work to help protect all wildlife. But of course, our bears is a great poster child for it um, and protecting our bears. We talked about these no stopping um, zones. Um, and again, we'll go back to the implementation of the one for our white grizzly bear. Nakoda, our white grizzly bear, this year she actually came out of her den um, with two cubs. It was the first time breeding, um, so again she's seven and a half years old. It was her first time coming out of her den with her cubs. Um, they were two brown cubs, but people have been admiring them for a few weeks now. And if you remember, I mentioned that Nakoda is a climber. And so again, with this knowledge in mind, knowing that Nakoda likes to climb uh, all these fences, Parks Canada has actually started electrifying these fences to help protect many animals, but Nakoda being a really big target animal for that. Um, unfortunately, uh, it has not all gone super easily. And last Thursday, uh, both of her cubs were actually hit by cars and killed in along the highway of Yoho National Park. And about 24 hours later, Nakoda still hanging out in the same area she herself was also hit by a car. Um, the cubs were killed, but Nakoda um, is still alive. I've not heard anything else about it. She was injured. Uh, Parks Canada was actually there and saw it. Um, vehicles kind of swerving to try and get out of the way. Um, first vehicle swerved, second vehicle unfortunately did hit Nakoda. Um, and, but it said that she just has, she does have some injuries and they say, you know, bears have survived much worse injuries than that. So they do seem pretty confident that Nakoda is going to survive. Um, and they talk about, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's really, really sad. Um, myself and some of the, like one of the other expedition leaders, we were texting about it because it is, it's a really big thing that has happened um, in just the last few, past, the past few days that is showing that we do still have a lot of room to grow in terms of um, improving our protection of our bear species. Our national parks have done an incredible job so far, but we still have more to learn. And when they talk about electrifying fences, they're still actively doing it, but Parks Canada, um, you know, reading articles about it, and they're simply saying they cannot stay on top of it. They electrify one area, Nakota finds a gap. Um, they electrify that area, she finds another gap. They have so many kilometers of fence to electrify and just only so much time in a day and manpower to do it. So um, there's still lots of improvements that we need to do, but the parks have done a really incredible job of protecting our bears. Um, and so, yeah, we are still working on making sure we're protecting them. We're being respectful of them. When we are driving in the national parks, they also reduce our speed limits, our no stopping zones, um, photographers being encouraged to not even take or publish photos of these bears so that it doesn't encourage the flocks of people. People hear about a white grizzly bear and you can imagine the surge of, of people who have come to visit the already very, very busy national parks, just specifically looking for Nakoda. So trying to make sure we're doing our best to be respectful for them. Um, 
So this is kind of the last slide here that I just love to encourage people to be bear aware. Um, we've talked about several of these tactics and many of them are things that you can do at home, um, making sure that your fruit trees aren't dropping fruit all over your front yards and encouraging bears to come in. They become food conditioned. What happens when that food resource uh, kind of dries up? Making sure that when we're camping in the back country, we're not leaving food out uh, for them, any attractants. Um, making sure that when we're walking around in bear country, that we're making noise and we're making sure that we're not surprising any bears. It's typically surprise bears that are bad uh, encounters. We just don't want to surprise bears. They do typically want to just stay away from us. Um, so making sure that we're being really respectful and just talking about it, talking about um, bear, pro uh, bear uh, protection in various parks. Uh, our overpasses and underpasses, people from all over the world have come specifically for our overpasses, I should say, um, come here and they've been implemented in many, many areas now. So there's so much that there's a wealth of knowledge that we can share um, in order to just be more bear aware and make sure that we're protecting our bears and as a result, a whole bunch of other species. But um, that will be the end of um, my little talk here. So I guess we'll open it up for questions. I've left time for questions. Yay, I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Leanne. Okay, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let, let's get to these questions. So, so how much danger do these iconic bears have to worry about from hunters? So there's no hunting in the national parks themselves. So within the park boundaries, they are safe. Um, and British Columbia, the province of BC, does currently have a ban, a complete total ban across the hunting of grizzly bears. So even within the province of BC, they are um, like safe. But that's not to say that, uh, you know, they can't be killed from obviously vehicle collisions, um, but asking specifically about hunters, retaliatory, retaliatory, I always struggle saying that word, killings can happen in Alberta. Um, they can still be hunted. And there was one bear, again, this was prior to the hunting. There was one bear that was uh, translocated and killed by a hunter as she was making her way back over to the parks. So it's a pretty minimal uh, thing that we expect to impact the bears for now there is a lot of people who are trying to uh, overturn the grizzly bear hunt and they do want to bring the grizzly bear hunt back to the province of bc um, so for now there's no hunting there is no hunting in the national parks and for now there's no hunting within the province of bc got it great thank you so much um, so do we know how long the gestation period for a bear is <laughs> Yeah, so gestation period, you can look at it in two ways. Does gestation period begin in the spring when mating happens, sperm meets egg, but again, no development is happening. Most of the time, if you look up gestation period for bears, they'll typically say 270-ish days because they start it from uh, that spring mating period. But if you look at development phase, so again, no development happening in the summer, they go into their den in the fall, embryo implants because they have enough fat on them development begins the development phase is actually only about 60 days so 60 days for that tiny 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 little set of cells to become a bear cub and when the bear cubs do come out after that 60 days they are also very tiny those cubs weigh one to two pounds um, they're quite small uh, even smaller than that if you're looking at our our black bears but they can be very very petite and they have to put on weight very quickly uh, when they're in the den so that when they do come out into the real world they have strength and size to actually traverse over some of the ecosystem but again and that's going to be my short answer because otherwise I could talk for another hour about bear reproduction. <laughs> another webinar, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how does the male know if the cubs are his or not with the, with the female? Uh, and has the boss killed any of his own cubs or just unrelated cubs? Um, so it's another great question. Um, we pulled the bears and unfortunately they don't exactly answer, but our best guesses um, are to do with the scenting. So um, I didn't talk a ton about it, but bears, they do have an absolutely incredible sense of smell. They are also very, very intelligent. So the current theories is kind of that they can know and recognize a female. So if a male sees a female, um, either scent wise or just recognition of that, of that female, they'll know I bred with that female, those cubs could be mine. 
but it is also a tactic um, that uh, bears can take. So males, they wanna breed with lots of females because the more they can spread the gene their genetics, the better. Females actually will breed with multiple males. Now here, it's not for genetic purposes. Here, the theory is that it's to help protect the cubs. If a female has bred with all five of these males, then it means that those males for the next three years, in theory, will leave those cubs alone uh, because they could be theirs. And if a female does have cubs, if she has three cubs, all three can actually have different fathers. So create some genetic diversity, but we don't truly know the answer. Uh, we suspect that in infanticide of their own cubs is not something that happens because it kind of defeats the entire purpose of them wanting to have their genetics go on. But of course, it's not to say that it's impossible and it won't happen. Um, to my knowledge, the like, no, the boss has not killed any of his cubs that we suspect are his anyway. So, yeah. And are females receptive to a male who has murdered their cubs? Uh, yeah, well, receptive is maybe not the word that I would use in the animal kingdom. Typically, breeding is not always viewed as the most um, pleasant. Uh, it can be very aggressive. And so particularly, yes, if a male has killed cubs, um, they'll tend to hang around. And that female is not going to be a very happy camper. But yeah, they will eventually be able to breed. And sometimes it's a little bit more forced, at least initially. And then the bears tend to hang out different breeding tactics. Some bears will pick, some male bears will pick one female and they'll stick with that one female and they protect that one female and don't let any other males near them for the entire breeding season. Others will just hang out with one female for a few days, move on, hang out with another female um, and kind of spread their seed as much as possible. But yeah, they can, um, they can breed even after a cub kill. And so if the boss has uh, so many cubs in one small area, is interbreeding an issue? Or um, yeah, I knew, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. I knew what you meant. Um, yeah, it's it's it, it's one of those things. Like the bears ecosystems, wildlife, they kind of know how to keep a relative balance. And so he's been able to sire a lot of cubs, but he is also now coming to the end of his um, reign, most likely. Um, and so we want to have some overlap. Inbreeding, yeah, can be possible, um, but we'll they'll have overlap with other cubs that are going to be sired from other males. And as he now is eventually, at some point, going to retire from his dominant phase, then other males will move in and it allows for more of that genetic diversity. So um, ecosystem systems do like to stay at a relative balance. So um, they'll, yeah, that will, the, that will allow for the genetic diversity to persist. So is Nakoda, the white female bear, different than the white spirit bears that some of us have read about? Yeah, so the spirit bear is actually a white black bear. Um, and so the, that one is on the coast of BC. Um, so you can go see them um, in the Great Bear Rainforest. Yeah, people will go over and, and spot that bear versus this one being our grizzly. How do the grizzly populations compare to Yellowstone in that area? Hmm, that is a great question. Um, and I actually don't know the population density of Yellowstone. So it would be something that I would have to look into. So um, it might be similar because I think that, you know, in the Yellowstone area, they're pretty known for uh, their, I follow some significant bears on Instagram <laughs> that uh, have, have had uh, Instagram accounts made for them specifically in the Yellowstone area. So I know they're quite prominent, but I'm going to say I don't actually know the uh, density of the grizzly bears in Yellowstone. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that one. Is there any issues with overpopulation of the bears at this point? Um, it's one of the reasons why people will talk about uh, re-implementing some of the grizzly bear hunt. Um, one of the other hats that I that I wear in my life is uh, caribou conservation, and we do a lot of that in British Columbia. And there are pockets of BC that folks will argue have far too high of a grizzly bear density, um, or far too high of a grizzly bear population, and they're killing too many of the calves, and it's why uh, the caribou are struggling so much. So um, there will be areas that, yes, people will argue that are overpopulated, but right next door can be areas where they'll argue that they are still in low population numbers. So um, depending on who you talk to, you might get a different answer. Gotcha. So are 
aren't any of the aliens a uh, a non-native species and if they aren't if they aren't a non-native species what would the bears have eaten prior to the dandelions being there it's another great question. I have to say I don't know much about the beginnings, the origin stories of our dandelions. Um, there is a whole bunch of different plants. Um, as I said, there's like 200 plant species that they'll be eating in a year. Um, and so dandelions just tends to be, you know, people hear about it all the time of like no mo may. I take into that very commonly of like wanting to keep our dandelions for our bees because it's one of the first flowers to come up. Um, but we have a whole bunch of other flowers, uh, tubers, they'll be going after ants, uh, like there's tons and tons of other food around. So in years, dandelions have just become a really prominent, prominent food source for them in the spring. So um, in throughout, and that's just one that's just going to be happening now. And then by the time our trips start, there's not dandel dandelions even left and it's other food uh, sources that are available. So it would just be other flowers and other plants that they'd be going after because it's not exclusively dandelions right now. It's just a really common one. How many bears are killed by trains uh, every in general? And is there some way we can help to avoid this situation? Um, yeah, it's a great question. There are years when we're not really seeing the impacts and I hear about it mostly in this area. So I can't speak to like the train all across Canada. Cause I'll tell you that the, any bear, um, hits that might happen, say like going across parts of Ontario, that news doesn't necessarily make it all the way out to me, um, as I'm living in BC, but there are years when we have, um, higher fatalities of, um, of our grizzlies and it's not saying like oh each year 30 grizz grizzlies are going to be getting killed it's like a bad year if we hear of any that are getting killed one or two um a couple of years ago we actually had really bad highway mortalities and it's it's what changed the speed limits that was through yoho national park they reduced the speed limit a lot through yoho because it's just become such a hot spot for it so um yeah in terms of how many are happening each year it depends but typically we're aiming for zero and if we hear of any then it's um it's not what we're wanting to hear what can we do uh parks canada is you know they're working on things and even like via rail and and the companies that are operating through them or cp rail they um they're they're doing things like trying to update their green housing um and you know doing that diversionary feeding the you know honking of their their horns and making themselves known but it is something that like just talking about it i think is is an important piece of making sure that we're making improvements because if the more people know about um the train issues the grain issues then the more people get involved right get involved when you're hearing about it and um there'll be people who are actively trying to change things um and even just like updates to the rail line um the uh, rail line itself that that'll be instigated because people are getting upset so um rob and i were actually talking about this before the webinar started but um it was like conflict is how we make change and so i'm not saying conflict across the board is good but we do need conflict to make change we need people to be upset about things in order to make change so being aware of it is like a great first step and then just getting involved and in trying to make action to to change that Great. Thank you. So if I wanted to come up there to visit, what's the best time of year for me to see the bears? The best time of year to see bears. Um, when they're awake is a great start. So out of hibernation, <laughs> um, I mean, I like you can see them all throughout the year. So spring, we have we have good views of them uh, just along the highway, sometimes uh, eating the dandelions. But we know, um, like people know in the parks, they know where they're kind of moving throughout the summertime. So on our Canadian Rockies trips, we specifically target areas. Um, so one of them is the Lake Louise scale, like Ski Hill. We'll go up the Lake Louise gondola um, because we can be in a gondola above looking down at prime grizzly bear habitat. Um, and so people can come in the summertime and just kind of plan their times of when they can see them. But I've seen many bears in May, June, July, August, September. Um, so you can see them all, but it's just luck of the draw. I've also gone through and spent seven days in a in the national park and not seen any bears. So um, it's just a uh, luck of the draw, really. But all the whole the whole time that they're awake is kind of times that you can see them. So also depends on what other activities you want to see. The spring can be a really good time to see them, but there's a lot of other stuff that is inaccessible um, because of all of our snow still in the mountains and um, you know things not being that busy and prominent. So yeah, all season. 
Those overpasses look pretty amazing. Would that yeah. be something that we would see on a nat hab trip? Yeah, yeah. So we will drive um, on the highway. You actually see them on your shuttle from the Calgary airport into Banff. You'll see uh, that you'll definitely see the one that's in construction. And then as we're driving, we'll see a few of them um, on our time when we're there. So we do talk about them in our um, on our trips as well. Is that something that we could hike across? Um, no, or is it they are wildlife exclusive. People are not up on them. Um, there's fencing up there so that they remain a uh, wildlife only area. If people were using them, then it would deter animals from using them entirely. So nope, we end up just seeing them from, from the comfort of our vehicles. And I always think it's fun as we're going up because they're designed so that like, as I'm going and coming up to one, I'm not just seeing a moose or seeing a bear. Um, they're designed in a way that when they're traveling over them, they're not being seen because if they were on display, there are still many animals that would choose not to use it. So I, whenever I'm going under, just imagine that perhaps there is a bear walking above me at this moment. You never know. You never know. Well, thank mm -hmm. you, Anne. Unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us today. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining today. Um, I hope you've grown to have a bit of an affinity and a fascination. Hopefully you already have that for our bears, but particularly now our bears in the Canadian Rockies, they're pretty special. Um, and I think it's incredible the work that's been done already by Parks Canada to help protect them. Um, the involvement of people as well, our visitors, that is absolutely essential in protecting our bears. And um, now you've hopefully got some new tactics and new topics to discuss with other people and can help continue the conversation about more ways that we can help protect our bear species. So thanks for joining. Um, come out on a Rockies trip and we absolutely do our best to find some bears. We have pretty good luck. We've got pretty good success rates in finding uh, bears on our trips along with other wildlife. So please do come out. Um, we've got lots to see out here. They're super fun trips. Leanne, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.